All right, so this morning I'm going to be starting kind of a new series. We're going to be hearing a lot of sermons about this, and the, the series I'm going to be starting is on the attributes of God. And the purpose is just to get the proper understanding of who God is, and we should always want to let the Bible tell us about God and not try to make the Bible fit our own presupposed ideas about who we think God is or who we think God should be, because this is the problem that many people get into, which is a form of idolatry where people are just kind of making up their own God. I mean, this happens all the time. I talk to people on a regular basis, usually out soul winning, but often so just in, in, in many situations, you talk to people and they'll say, well, God, I think God's like this. And I think, and you know, they usually have no reason to actually believe that other than it's just what they think. It's just the way that they feel. It's just, well, I think that God is like this or God would be like this if he existed. The Bible tells us all about God, all about him, so that we don't have to be strangers to who God is and to what God is like. So I'm going to go through and spend the next however long it takes and just kind of pull out some main characteristics of God. And this is in no particular order, okay? I'm not starting with like the most important characteristic. We're just going through, I'm, I'm going through to one that just stuck out to me and then kind of build, decided to build a full series out of this because it is important to understand who God is and to let the Bible tell us who he is. So one of the things this morning, obviously this chapter that we read, the vast majority of Leviticus 26 is not a very positive chapter. It starts off very positive. It starts off saying, hey, you obey me, you do this, you're gonna, I'm going to bless you, you're going to have rain, you're going to have all this good stuff happen. But that only lasts for the first, what, about 13 verses? And the whole chapter has 46 verses. And from there, he starts saying, well, if you don't listen to me, here's what's going to happen. And he says, if you still don't listen to me, here's what's going to happen. And if you still don't listen to me, here's what's going to happen. And it goes on and on and on. And all the way up until the end where he gives that glimmer of hope again saying, but, you know, if you repent, if you come back to me, if you recognize that you were wrong and you should have done these things and you, and you come back to me, then I can restore you. And that's, that's ultimately the way this chapter ends. But the subject matter I'm going to preach on goes way beyond this. Uh, and the attribute we're going to be dealing with this morning is God's anger or his fury or his wrath. And I added those, you know, it's, it, anger isn't just enough. Because first of all, many people just think that being angry by itself is a sin, which it's not. The Bible says, um, um, be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon thy wrath. There are times to be angry and when there's righteous anger and, and there's nothing wrong with being angry. We see God getting angry a lot in the scripture. And this is one of the reasons why I'm preaching on this this morning. It's just because of the, vol the sheer volume of Scripture that we have that talks about God's anger, His wrath, and His fury. And wrath and fury, I, I included those just in the title of my sermon because those are really strong words. I mean, if you, you, when, some, when you say someone's angry, you don't really get the best idea, especially in our vernacular and our speaking today. If you say, oh, so-and-so is angry, well, what does that really mean? I mean, they might have been a little bit upset. Some people get angry when their food comes out cold or they, you know, someone screwed up their order. You say, oh, they got angry. But how angry are they really? But when you say that, like, man, the wrath of Pastor Burzins came down, if you're going to use language like that, are you just going to think, well, I got a little bit upset about, about my food order being screwed up. No, that's probably not the, what's going to be going on in your mind of, of understanding what, I'm, what someone's trying to say. You'd be like, man, what did he do? You know? What? <laughs> and the Bible uses these words, fury, furious. Like God is extremely angry with people and with their sin throughout Scripture. And this is, this is enough to characterize you know, part of who God is. 
And another reason I'm starting with this is because everybody's heard that God is love. And believe me, we are going to get to that attribute because it is an extremely important attribute. But I think that things are too lopsided of only hearing all of the positive attributes and not hearing these other attributes of God, of who God is, that are going to be a little bit more negative. But look, these are extremely important attributes to go in depth on. Again, because of the sheer volume that we could look through scriptures and just see over and over again, how many times is, are we reading about God being angry, about God being full of wrath, and God being furious? God is so angry with some people. God was so angry with the devil and his angels that he created hell. Let that sink in. You know, hell isn't just some place that pre-existed before God. Hell isn't just, oh, well, what am I going to do? Oh, I'll throw him over into that place. God created hell. God decided that I'm going to make a place called hell, a place of eternal burning and torture and torment where whoever is in that place is only going to be experiencing pain. They're going to be weeping. They're going to be wailing. And God is going to be witnessing all of that. And he's okay with that. He created that place. So let's get a proper view about who God is. People get offended today just at the mention of hell. <gasps> How could you do it? I just had someone tell me that if you tell someone, if you tell a kid that their grandparent went to hell, that's child abuse. Child abuse. Because you're causing this mental anguish and pain that the thought that their grandparent might be in hell. Well, look. I hate to break it to you, but God's the one who made the place called hell. God's the one who sends people to hell that don't receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And whether it's someone that you personally have loved a lot or someone you didn't even know, that changes nothing. And you want to tell the person who's trying to tell you the truth trying to explain reality to you and say, this is a fact. This is part of who God is. God created hell and some people are going there. If you're going to try to condemn that person for telling you the truth, I mean, this is just indicative of the day that we live in today, that we know in the last days, perilous times shall come, and then we know there'll be people going to be heaping themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they only want to hear good, and they only want to hear positive, and they only want to just have their back scratched, and their ears tickled, and they could go home and just not think about anything negative ever and just stick their head in the sand and pretend like everything's just fine. We live in America, good old U.S. of A. Man, everything's going good. We can do no wrong. Government do no wrong. That's not reality. It's not reality. We need to be able to face these things and we need to understand who God is because when we get a proper understanding of the wrath and the fury of God, that should help bring a whole nother level of respect that you're going to show towards your creator, towards your boss, towards your Lord that made you, that bought you, and you don't want to take God off. You don't want to experience any of this, what God has. And we're going to get into this because God, the Bible says in Psalm 711, God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. You say, well, Pastor Rose, I don't think that's a really big you know, attribute of God is anger. He's angry with the wicked every single day. Do you think that might be you know, important enough to say, yeah, maybe this is, a, this is a characteristic of God? Every day. And as we get into this, we're going to see it's not just the wicked. If you want to refer to the wicked as being you know, these unsaved people, these reprobates, God gets angry with his people too. Okay, God's anger doesn't stop at say, oh, well, he's only angry with unsaved people. No, he's not. Absolutely not. In fact, we, in, you know, I, actually, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to make a statement without really knowing, but just based off, when I, when I think of just kind of basing off of memory, God's angry with his people. 
I'd venture to say more often than we see references to him being angry with the heathen, which we do see a lot of that. I mean, we see a lot of condemnation and, and wrath on the heathen, but I, I, I would be willing to bet that we see a lot more of God being angry with his own people, with the people of Israel. It's just, it's just a huge portion of Scripture we have that. Um, so let's dig into this a little bit. We're going to reread some of Leviticus 26. I'm not going to get into all of it because uh, we already went through so much. But um, now it's not just like that God is, is angry and full of wrath with no cause either, right? Like God, God's not just flying off the handle for no reason whatsoever. It's not just part of his character where he's just going to, well, he just woke up on the wrong side of the bed, right? No, that's, that's, not, that's not a characteristic of God. God gets angry, but it's always for a reason. And as we get in depth and start to study all, a lot of the good attributes of God, it becomes even more apparent why God gets so angry when you understand his goodness and when you understand his love and when you understand his long suffering and his mercy and everything else that he's done for people, it, it starts to really click. Well, how can God have so much anger and fury and wrath? Because he's done so much. I mean, imagine just, just you continue to do good. You continue to support. You continue to provide. You continue just day after day to help people out and to be there for them and to be willing to help. And they just spit in your face. And, and mouth off to you and want to have nothing to do with you, that's going to make anybody get angry. And the more good you do for someone, the more angry you're going to get when they just despise you and want to have nothing to do with you. And this is what many people do to God. He's given everything. He's given His only begotten Son. He's, given, he's done all He can do. And, and he's still making sure people are clothed and fed and, and, you know, and people just continue to just put God out of mind and, and not think about him or just come up with their own God and not care about who God really is. Um, it makes God angry. But let's look here in Leviticus 26 specifically. These are people who are despising God's statutes. They, they've heard, they have heard the Lord, the, the law of the Lord. They've heard the commandments, and they will have nothing to do with them. Look at verse number 14. Because this is addressed to his people. This is addressed to Israel. Verse 14. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, oh man, I, I hate all those rules in the Bible. I hate those commandments. So, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror. You know, terror is extreme fear. You're terrified of something. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you in terror. So, in a way, you can say God's a terrorist, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I call him a you know, obviously, I'm making a little bit of light of it, but, but seriously, he is instilling terror into people's hearts and into their minds when they refuse to, to listen to him and obey his commandments. He says, you know what? I'm going to make sure that you are just terrified. And I'm going to instill terror in you by understanding, you know, when I, when I start to um, <clears throat> be contrary to you. Look at verse number uh, 16 where we were. He says, I will even appoint over you terror consumption and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart and you shall sow your seed in vain for your enemies shall eat it and I will set my face against you and you shall be slain before your enemies they that hate you shall reign over you and you shall flee when none pursueth you and if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me then I will punish you seven times more for your sins so all this punishment is coming for a good reason it's for their sins because they're not listening to his commandments. They want to have nothing to do with his commandments. They despise his commandments. I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield or increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. So it starts off with them 
you know, experiencing some hunger, going through some harder times, you know, their businesses are going down, basically, they're not yielding as much crops, they're working real hard, but they're not really getting much back. He's making things tight. He's making things difficult for them. Why? Because he's trying to bring them low. Because when you have abundance and you have all this wealth, people have a tendency to get lifted up in pride and full of themselves and thinking, well, what do I need anyone for? What do I need to listen to God for? So he starts by, okay, I'm going to show you why you need to rely on me. And that, but then we see, he's like, but if you still don't listen, if this isn't going to get your attention, then things are going to get worse and worse and worse, continually worse, up until it gets to the point, look where it says, um, in verse 20, 28, verse 28, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And there's that worry. So, I mean, he's just extremely angry. I'm going to walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. That's pretty serious. They're eating, he's saying, you're going to be eating your own children. Why? Because they're so hungry. Because there's such a famine in the land, I'm going to be so, if you just continue to not listen to me, it's going to make God so angry, is what he's saying here. He's like, you just, you, you ignore me. You're not following the commandments. You're not following the commandments. I'm going to get so angry that I'm going to make sure that you don't have any food to the point to where you're willing to eat your children. <coughs> furious. He's furious with these people that their, their neck is so stiff and their heart is so hard that they just will not get right with God. They refuse to. And he says, I'm going to keep on until you get right. Keep pushing harder. And, and God's gonna, God has a much more, um, much more resolve. Some people might call it stubbornness. Right? Don't test God. Don't tempt God. God will be able to, you know, you think you want to you wanna disobey God and, and not listen to God. Just see how long that lasts for you because he'll outlast you uh, every single time. And he said, these people, they want to not listen to my commandments. He's going to make it worse and worse and worse and keep on um, increasing the pressure upon them. He says, I will destroy your high places and cut down your images and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols and my soul shall abhor you. He says, God's, God's the one saying, my soul shall abhor you. Abhor is, again, it's, it's extreme hatred. He said, my soul is going to hate you. Yes, this is the same God, that the God of love. This is the same God. So while God is love, absolutely, it doesn't mean he doesn't hate. And does this say, my soul shall hate the sin that you've committed. My soul shall abhor the sin. No, he says, my soul shall abhor you. That's personal, that's individual. And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation and I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. And I will bring the land into desolation and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished. He said, even your enemies, the people that hate you, the people I'm going to bring in that are going to conquer you, they're just going to be like, wow. Wow, these people have just, are just <laughs> going through all manner of evil. That's how bad it's going to be. And that's something when, you're, when your enemy, because you know, when you think about it, their, their enemies are probably for, you know, they're not going to care very much about them. They're their enemies, right? They're not going to have as much compassion about them. But he said, it's going to get to the point where your enemies are just like astonished at how bad things have gotten for this people. And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 7. And you can do your own, I, you know, I would encourage you, do your own word study. It's real easy these days to do word studies, especially with digital technology, because you don't even need to use like an, a concordance or, you know, a book reference to try to find all the references. 
it's real easy to go online or to use a tool of a, like a Bible tool to just search for words. Search for words like fury and wrath and anger and just look at how many there are. And, and, and you know what? Combine that with the Lord or Lord, right? Anger, Lord, wrath, Lord. We're just finding both of those words in the same verse together. And just see how many there are. Just see how many times this comes up. I am going through very, 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 very few examples just for sake of time. I mean, literally, there's, there's so many. Like, I don't even have an example from the book of Ezekiel. And you can just go chapter after chapter after chapter about the anger of the Lord and the wrath of the Lord and, and that people are going to know that I'm the Lord and I'm going to do all this stuff to these people because they need to know that I'm the Lord. Read through Ezekiel. I have zero examples from there. Jeremiah chapter 7, look at verse number 9. <clears throat> the Bible reads, Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? What he's saying here, Look at all the sins in verse 9. He's saying, you're gonna, you know, are you going to steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely? You're going to do all of this stuff, right? You're going to go out and just sin, all this sin. And then you're going to come in to my house, which is called by my name, and say, oh, well, we're delivered to do all these abominations. Basically that, well, we're saved. We'll just go and do whatever. We're delivered to do all these abominations. We were delivered out of Egypt. We were brought into this land so we could just do whatever we want. And you're going to say that in my house? Verse 11, in this house, which is called by my name, or is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And again, this is in reference to his people. He's saying, go, go check out Shiloh. You're going to continue on in your wicked ways and you're going to build up your idols and burn incense on the false gods and you're going to go off and sin and commit adultery and murder and swear falsely. You're going to do all this stuff. Look at what I did to Shiloh. Don't think that this can't happen to you too. Oh, but we're children of Israel. Everything will be just fine. No, go, go check out. God's saying, go look what I did to Shiloh. Destroyed. Verse number 13. And now, because ye have done all these works that the Lord and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. And I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And again, we see a little bit of the reason why he's so angry. He said, I've risen up early. He's sending his prophets. He's trying to get through the people. He's giving them warning. He's trying to get them back on track, and they just continue to refuse. They refuse, 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 refuse. And he says, that's it. I've had enough. You're going to be destroyed. Look at verse number 15. And I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Here's an attribute of God. Don't push things too far with him because he won't even hear prayer. In certain cases, he won't even listen to you. He doesn't want to hear it at all. When people have pushed things too far with God, he says, that's it. I've had enough with you. He said, don't even pray for those people. You know what they're saying? There are certain people that the Bible's saying you shouldn't even pray for them. And it's not just in this one verse. There's other verses that basically are going to tell you the same thing. You say, but I thought we're supposed to pray for everybody. Not blindly, not just blanket pray for everybody. Not if there's a people that God's trying to cast out of his sight. He said, because that's what he said here. I'll cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren, even the old seed of Ephraim. Therefore, pray not thou for this people. 
Neither lift up cry or prayer for them, neither make intercession to me. Don't intercede for them. Now, is intercessory prayer a good thing? Sure, we see Moses doing a lot. We see a lot of people in the Bible doing a lot. But he's saying, you know what? Not with this people. Not with these people right here. They've gone too far, and they just need to suffer from my wrath. Because I'm furious with them, and there's going to be no standing in between me and them. And this is a God of mercy saying these things, by the way. So we need to take heed that we don't treat God. We make up, conjure up some image of God in our own mind that no matter what anybody ever does, God is always going to be merciful. No, he's not. No, he's not. Now, his mercy is great. Absolutely. We'll get into that. <laughs> but <laughs> there is a limit. There is a limit. Don't push things too far with God. You definitely don't want to be in this position where he's like, don't even pray for these people. That's, that's done. Look at uh, verse number 17. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they provoke me to anger. So what was the provocation here? Previously we saw when they're not keeping his commandments. Here it's because, yeah, they're not keeping his commandments, but it's, 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 it's an anger based on they're going after other gods. They're not serving me. They're burning it. They're, they're, they're kindling a fire and they're making up their, their offerings and their sacrifices unto the queen of heaven. Is there a queen of heaven? No. We're not Catholic. We don't believe in, in Mother Mary being the Queen of Heaven. Okay, that's a heathen religion. That's a pagan religion that was brought into Christianity by the Catholic Church or by the pagans into that, uh, that organization. That's not a biblical thing. Verse 19, Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves the confusion of their own faces? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast and upon the trees of the field and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and shall not be quenched. This is extreme anger. You say, but what did the animals do to God? It doesn't matter. <laughs> they didn't do anything. God got so angry with these people, he's just wiping everything out. I mean, the trees, the plants, the animals, he's just saying, I'm just going to let it all burn with unquenchable fire. It's all going to be destroyed. That is some very serious anger there. Flip over to chapter 21 in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 21. Jeremiah 21, look at verse number 1, the Bible reads, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, when King Zedekiah sent unto him Pasher the son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah the son of Maasiah the priest, saying, Inquire, I pray thee, of the Lord for us. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, maketh war against us. If so be that the Lord will deal with us according to all his wondrous work, that he may go up from us. So, <laughs> In this story, this is King Zedekiah. This is real late in, in the children of Israel's um, existence with, with having kings. You know, like just before they're completely, just utterly taken captive. And they've been warned over and over and over and over again by the prophets, even by Jeremiah, previous to this, a lot. And this is just, I mean, Jeremiah's already said, don't fight them. You know, just, just, this is what God would have for you to do at this point. The judgment's coming. It's too late. But they still just continue to say, well, hey, go, go ask God for us. Why don't you go, go ask God and just see if, if he'll, if he'll uh, deal with us according to all his wondrous works that he may go up from us. 
They're finally looking to go to God. But you know it's too late. It's too late. You say, but I thought of, you know, when people are looking to God, that God will always hear them. Not when it's too late. Not when he's already said no. Look at verse number two, or verse number three. Then said Jeremiah unto them, Thus shall ye say to Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So here's God's answer. Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, wherewith ye fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans, which besiege you without the walls, and I will assemble them into the midst of the city. And I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. He's like, forget about Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to just fight against you. That's how angry God is. He's saying, I'm just, I'm so angry. You think I'm going to help you? He's I'm going to fight against you. Verse 6, And I will smite the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. And afterwards, saith the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants, and the people, and such as are left in this city, from the pestilence, from the sword, and from the famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those that seek their life. And he shall smite them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them, neither have pity, nor have mercy. This goes back to God having the outstretched hand. God trying to help his people. God trying to warn them. God trying to do everything until they just reject, reject, rejected. And this reminds me actually of Proverbs chapter 1. This wasn't in my notes. But if you want to flip over to Proverbs 1 real quick, this also helps explain why God gets so angry with people. <clears throat> What we're we looking at this morning, we're looking at characteristics of God, and specifically we're looking at God's anger and his wrath. Proverbs 1, look at verse number 24. The Bible says, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have said it not, all my counsel. It means you just made all my advice, all, everything I'm trying to tell you, you just, you just treated it like nothing. I'm like, yeah, whatever. And would none of my reproof I also will laugh at your calamity. So when things start spiraling out of control and you have all these problems, God says, well, I'm just going to laugh then. Because you didn't want to listen to me. You didn't want to have anything to do with me, so I'm going to laugh. I'm going to think it's funny. I will mock when your fear cometh. Yeah, all of a sudden you're getting afraid because you didn't want to listen to me. I'm going to start mocking you. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me. And this is really important. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Is this who you understand God to be? Do you understand this aspect of God? This is why we're going over this this morning, because this is a part of who God is. Contrary to popular opinion among Christendom, in today's society, today's culture, saying, God will always hear you. God will always answer you. Not always. Again, lots of mercy, lots of long suffering, and lots of people he will hear. A lot. But there's a point where God's going to say, I'm just going to mock you. I'm just going to laugh at you and I'm not going to listen to you. And I don't care how many times you call out because you're getting what's coming to you because you've gotten me so angry that I'm past the point now of, of you reconciling yourself to me. Now you're just going to get it. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. 
Whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Flip over to Nahum chapter number one. Nahum, the minor prophets after all the uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. We start getting into the smaller books of the Bible before the New Testament. Nahum chapter number one. And we're going to start reading in verse number one of Nahum, chapter number one. The Bible reads, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. Now look, these are some attributes. We're gonna, I'm probably going to do one on jealousy also. That's, that's another sermon for another day. We see right there, God is jealous. I thought jealousy was a bad thing. God is jealous. I mean, just like the verse, God is love, God is jealous. This is describing who God is. The Lord revengeth. We're getting into that tonight. The, to this morning and this evening sermons are tied to go hand in hand. We got the anger of God, and tonight I'm going to be preaching on justice and judgment and vengeance. That is that that God has. So that's a little sneak preview for, for this evening's sermon. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. Extremely angry. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Look at verse number three. This follows up all this real strong language about God being furious and he's angry. The Lord is slow to anger. And just think. The slower he is to anger, which God is slow to, he's not just flying off the handle. It's not just every little thing like, oh man, I made a mistake. I mean, think about it like, you know, if your kids just, just spill a drink at home or something, you, know, just, you shouldn't just be flying off the handle. It's like, well, it's not that big of a deal, right? But if there's just one thing after another, I'm telling them this, telling them that, telling them this, and just, just, just to keep on dis being disobedient and everything else, there's going to get to the point where it's just like, all right, you're, you're getting it now. Right? God is slow to anger. He's not, he doesn't just get angry quickly. It takes a while. It builds up. But when he, when he reaches the boiling point, man, God gets furious. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds of the dust of his feet. Jump down to verse number six. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. That's our text verse for this church. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Right after it just got done saying his fury is poured out, and the rocks are thrown down by him, the Lord is good. Everything about God is good. There's nothing wicked or wrong about the attributes of God. Even in his anger and his fury, these are all righteous things. Verse number eight, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. I'm going um, to turn to Isaiah chapter 30. We're actually almost done. Isaiah chapter 30. I went a little bit out of order. I, I mentioned hell kind of at the beginning of the sermon. But we're going to see from Isaiah chapter 30, you know, the fires of hell, we're going to see in the scripture here, are kindled by the breath of God. Like God is the one who is keeping hell burning and going and, and is completely in charge. Satan is not in charge of hell. Hell was created for Satan and his angels. That's the reason why God created it to begin with. But beyond that, now people also are going to be cast into hell. People are in hell right now. Souls of men are burning in hell at this moment. All those who didn't put their faith in the Lord, didn't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, burning in hell. And that is in the presence of God. That is not separated from God. That is, God is right there 
God is kindling that flame. God is pouring out his wrath and his fury in hell right now on people. Look at verse number 27, Isaiah chapter 30. The Bible says, Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire, and his breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of vanity. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. Ye shall have a song, as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart, as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. And the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard, and shall show the lightning, excuse me, the show the lighting down of his arm, with the indignation of his anger, and with the flame of a devouring fire, with scattering and tempest and hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. And in every place where the grounded staff shall pass, which the Lord shall lay upon him, it shall be with tabrets and harps, and in battles of shaking will he fight with it. Verse 33, for Tophet is ordained of old. Yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. And that, that place there, Tophet, this is just being used symbolically of hell. Tophet is also the, the place of the valley of the son of Hinnom. Where the, where the children were sacrificed and, and, and they put their children through the fire. And this is a, a, a place that, this is the reason why, you know, the Jews don't believe in a literal hell. They say, oh no, that's just a place and that, you know, there was just burning being done there and everything. But the way that the Bible uses these illustrations, it's to describe, it's using the place to describe a truth that's beyond that physical place. And it's real simple from the language. You can see that that's what's being said, that this is talking about something more, and not just in this place, but I mean all throughout the scripture. Don't let people turn you around about the doctrine of hell. I don't have time to get into that this morning. But um, they'll say, oh no, that's just Gehenna or Hades. And uh, that's not, you know, that's not the hell that you know it. And, and it's just people wanting to sound smart or not, maybe not wanting to believe in hell of just what the scripture teaches about it. So they're coming up with anything that they can to try to try to tone down that doctrine. But the Bible says here, again, Tophet is ordained of old. That's something that's from really long ago, not just some, you know, some current place at the time. This is ordained of old. Yea, for the king is prepared. He hath made it deep and large, the pile of his fire much wood, the breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. God's the one igniting that flame through his anger and through his fury. And this is why it's so important to understand the anger of the Lord because unbelievers are going to hell. They're going to hell. We have to understand that, that the sin makes God angry and a stiff neck makes God angry and that God is angry at the wicked every day. And not only does God get angry at the wicked, but he gets angry at his own people for being disobedient. We don't want to be on the receiving end of God's anger and his fury. Um, Hebrews 12, I'll just read this for you. Turn if you would to Revelation chapter 6. Last place I'll have you turn, Revelation chapter 6. We as believers need to have respect for God and fear God. And you're going to see that over and over again. Why do you need to fear God? Because God gets angry. Because God punishes. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 28, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So we need to learn. We, we need to walk humbly. We need to have grace. We need to walk with reverence and godly fear. We need to watch our steps. We need to respect God. And we need to make sure we have a real proper godly fear. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. What's a consuming fire? A fire that just keeps spreading and growing. That's New Testament, folks. 
Hebrews chapter 12, our God is a consuming fire. But I thought God is love. Yes, he's love, but he's also a consuming fire. There are both sides to God. He's not just one-sided and one face. He's multifaceted. I mean, think about God. Yeah, he's a little bit more complicated than just saying he's love. He's a lot of things. And the Bible's saying here he's a consuming fire. So let's, let's treat God with the respect that he deserves so that we don't make him angry ourselves. Now, in Revelation chapter 6, Obviously, in the book of Revelation, there's a lot of talk about God's wrath and his anger is going to be poured out on this earth in the end times. At the end of the world, he's just going to destroy a whole bunch of people and destroy the planet and just do all kinds of things. Um, but one thing that's also interesting here that we're going to see in Revelation chapter 6 specifically is the wrath of Jesus Christ, right? Now, obviously, we know that Jesus is God, so when we're going through these attributes of God, they apply to God. They apply to all of the Godhead. They apply to the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They apply to God in general. Okay? But some people have this weird notion that, well, the Father has the anger and the wrath, but the Son has the mercy and the grace. No. No. The Father has mercy and grace and long-suffering too, and the Son has wrath. And we're going to see wrath here in Revelation chapter 6. But when I did my word study on wrath, you know the word wrath appears in the Bible 198 times. Just the word wrath. Not including fury, not including anger, not including every other you know, word that's synonymous with that. Just wrath appears 198 times times in the Bible, and the vast majority of those times, it's referring to the wrath of the Lord, to God's wrath. That's a lot. That's a lot of times. This is why this is so important to understand this. <clears throat> Look at verse number 12 of Revelation chapter 6. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us Look at this. From the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ is the Lamb. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What does it say? He's coming down to earth and these people are freaking out. And this is the day of the Lord. And Jesus comes out and saying, hide us. Hide us. Because Jesus is angry. He's furious. And we don't even, we don't want to see him. We want to make sure he doesn't see us. Let's hide from him. Because of his extreme anger and fury. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Jesus Christ, so angry that people are going, how, who can possibly stand before his great wrath and anger? This is part of who God is. You cannot deny it. If you deny this attribute of God, you're denying the entire Bible because you find scriptures and verses about the anger of God and the wrath of God from Genesis to Revelation. It's there. It's all throughout scripture. We need to remember this. We need to help ourselves get a godly fear, a fear of God that's righteous. And remember, you know what? God doesn't get angry. Let's not push it. Let's not just say, well, we're delivered to do all these things, right? Oh, I'm just, a, well, everybody's a sinner. So I'm not just going to, I'm not, I don't care about it, whatever. I'm just going to keep sinning. Watch out for attitude like that. You don't want to get in that place where you just minimize your own sin. 
Is it true that we're all sinners? Yes. Does God understand that we're sinners? Yes. Do, does God show us long suffering and mercy? Yes. But watch out for your attitude because what you're going to see in all these examples that we looked at, as well as many others, is that God actually cares about your attitude. That's really important to God. Probably even more important than just the physical act or sin that you, that you are guilty of is, is your heart and are you repentant? Do you care? Are you still trying to show God respect? Are you, you know, are you, are you looking to Him in truth or are you just having a really bad, stubborn attitude and saying, well, whatever, I'm just going to keep doing this anyways? Because that's when you're going to be sure to incur the, the fury, furious anger of the Lord. So we need to, we need to take this to heart and, uh, and never forget this. And as we go out this afternoon, don't forget that God is angry with the wicked every day and that there are people dying and going to hell that, you know, need to hear the gospel so that they don't have to experience the wrath of the Lord because of their rejection of Jesus Christ. Let's go out and try to show people that free gift, how that they could be saved. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for being who you are and for telling us about who you are, Lord. And I pray that you would please help us always to, to get our beliefs and our doctrines and what we know about you from your word and not just from the, the wicked devices of our own hearts that, that want to make and mold you into some image and some God that is not reality. Lord, help us to, to understand you better and know you better, Lord, and um, that we could have more, more respect unto you. And, and Lord, help us just to, to do what's right. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.